yeah, I decided to try and organise my own pelagics out of Southwest Rocks on the mid North Coast because there just wasn't anything regular um, mm. between uh, Port Stephens and Southport, really. So there's this big gap on the north coast of New South Wales where there weren't any regular pelagics going out. So, um, yeah. yeah, I just decided to try and organise a few myself and I haven't got anything up uh, regular yet. I haven't been, able to, haven't been able to commit to like a monthly mm. schedule or anything like that, but just now and then when I when I find the time and I've been trying to get boats out, yeah, because I, I just find seabirds so fascinating and, um, again, so much uh, potential for... I guess exploration and finding new birds and interesting stuff that in an area that hasn't been surveyed very very well. So. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Birding Today podcast, where birders come together to discuss the joy of birding. This is um, episode ten of season two, so it's going to be the last one for a bit. I'm going to take a break um, before season three. So thanks for being here. Um, and so I wanted to do something a bit different this time around, uh, give a few shout outs to some listeners who wrote in and uh, showed their appreciation um, for the show. The first one is to listener James Bennett, who lives in Newcastle. He enjoyed the episode with David Adam because James is also a birder musician and hasn't met anyone who does both. So that, that's, that was great. I enjoyed uh, reading James' message. Um, and you can find James on Instagram at James Bennett Birds and James Bennett Music. So thanks for reaching out, James. Also, um, I'd like to shout out to Craig Bowes, who sent an email saying he's loving the podcast and he does a lot of driving at work and it's got him through a lot of kilometers, which was really good to, good to hear. So that's, that's really cool. Craig has an art and photography business called Wild Portraits with some beautiful stuff on there, artwork and photos. And you can find him um, at www.wildportraits.com.au. So go and check that out. I'll put a link in the show notes as well. And if any other listeners want to write in and uh, just say hi, you can write to birdingtoday at gmail.com and I can give you a shout out on the next episode if you want. But now let's get into the episode. Let's jump right in. Today's guest is a full-time research assistant with Australian National University's Difficult Bird Research Group, where he's primarily involved with the National Regent Honey Eater Monitoring Program. He also assists with various other research and conservation projects, including noisy minor impact studies, Swift Parrot Monitoring, and King Island Brown Thornbill and Scrub Tit Surveys. He is a passionate recreational birder and considers himself a birding all-rounder. E-bird tragic, LGA and state lister, pelagic enthusiast, and hack photographer that dabbles in sound recording. I love it. So please welcome Liam Murphy on the show. How are you doing, Liam? Yeah, good, thanks, Guillaume. Thanks for having me. No problem, no problem. It's been a long time coming and I'm excited because um, you're, you're more... You're more of a local birder this time around because like I came up from Melbourne a few months ago and so mo most of the guests have been kind of Victorian based most of them and so I'm happy to kind of uh, delve into the New South Wales scene a bit as well so yeah. Yeah good well that, that's my thing <laughs> New South Wales yeah. Absolutely. I, um, I, haven't had, I haven't had much opportunity to sort of bird a lot outside of New South Wales just because of my personal circumstances work and that sort of thing over the years so I've really just sort of focused on local birding and, and, and state state birding, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so that leads into the, the first question, which is sort of, do you get lots of joy from, from uh, you know, birding more locally or, or just in, in New South Wales? Or how, where do you get the joy from birding principally, would you say? Yeah, I, I think the most exciting thing for me about birding is exploring new habitats and getting to places that I haven't been before, even even um, locally or within the state. Um, but, yeah, just, just exploring new places, new habitats and that sort of anticipation of, you know, what you might find in a, in a new, new spot. Um, yeah, what kind of interesting things you might see and just exploring, really, yeah. For sure, yeah, I, I love the anticipation. That's that, that's actually one of the highlights. Like, especially before like a big outing or like or before pelagic is especially the case when you're like on the dock and waiting to go out. And yeah, the anticipation yeah, really yeah. adds. Yeah, a lot of the um, yeah, the joy is sometimes not even in in the burning itself, but just seeing anticipation of of what you might find like before you get there. 
Yeah, for sure. And also, like, the, 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 the habitat itself, like, sometimes I, I just get joy from being in, in the birds' environment. Like, especially, this is especially the case with Dorigo National Park up in the mountains. Yeah, yeah, no, well, yeah. When you're in there, it's like, oh, the, like, it, it's, it's, and it's quite a lot cooler than, than down on the coast, like, because you're higher up. And so the, the kind of mountain air is a bit cooler and fresher, and it's, it's an amazing yeah, it's, environment. Yeah, it's a pretty special place. Yeah, yeah, I do love the rainforest. Find a rainforest, rainforest birding quite challenging, though. I love the, the calls are pretty tricky, the scrub wrens and, and that kind of thing. But yeah, and the, and the darkness, like, it's hard to, hard to see things. So that's quite challenging. But yeah, it's pretty, pretty special sort of habitat. No, nah, for sure, for sure. And so, how long have you been like bird watching? Is, has it been a thing that kind of uh, gradually started, or was there a specific moment? Like, what sparked your interest in, in birds? Um, yeah, so I, I was interested in birds from a very young age. So I grew up on a, a bush block, 30 acres of um, sort of woodland on the New England Tablelands, just outside of a little town called Bendemeer, um, which is between Tamworth and Armadale. Um, so, yeah, until I was 10, I uh, grew up in, on this bush block and was just fascinated with the birds. And um, my, my dad, he w wasn't a bird watcher, but he was, always had a general interest in wildlife and that was around the property. And he had the old um, Simpson and Day Birds of Australia. Yeah. So I think as, uh, as soon as I was old enough to thumb through a book, I, I yeah, just became obsessed with that book and literally just you know, read it until the pages were falling out of the spine. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I, I'd go off wandering up the, up the paddock and just looking at birds. Um, and, yeah, I have some vivid memories of, of being my childhood and, and hearing the, um, the bizarre scissor grinder call of the restless flycatcher. And, yeah. And then, you know, looking up and seeing, um, hearing the crested shrike tits tearing bark off the trees and and that kind of thing just those sort of um woodland birds of the, of the tablelands and inland slopes i have yeah that's a that's a sort of habitat that i still feel most um familiar with i guess and at home birding that kind of habitat and, um yeah then then from about the age of 10 i sort of i guess i lost interest a little bit um and and just did other things that Teenage boys were doing skateboarding and playing music and sports and that kind of thing and birding sort of, yeah, I, ne I never fully lost interest, but it was just, I guess, just laying dormant. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then through my 20s, I was just travelling a bit and, yeah, just playing in playing in bands. That was my other big big passion in my life has been music um, as well, just like uh, James and David Adam. Um and then I spent a couple of years in my late twenties traveling um, around Europe. And then it was when I got back from that big trip that I realized how much I'd missed the Australian bush. And so I started spending lots of time um, bushwalking and, and hiking and getting more and more interested in the birds again. And then I don't even know how it sort of just went from that that interest again into full on uh, the feverish obsession. <laughs> of, <laughs> it's it's all it's sort of a bit of a blur, but um, yeah, yeah. I think I've certainly made up for lost time. That lost time in my teens and twenties in the last six or seven years, just just gotten right back into it. And yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> no, for sure. That's that that's great. It's like the, the environment that you come from and your upbringing really contributes to how the rest of your life pans out, not only in what you're interested in, but, but in, in everything else as well. And I was lucky enough to, my dad was a birder and it still is a birder. So, so I, I kind of had that kind of uh, birding aura presence ever since I, w I was born really. So that kind of also helped me get into birding. And I've, I've also gone through phases. You do go through phases, I think, um, especially earlier on when I was younger, I kind of like, I, I also skateboarded and I also, I also play music. And so you, you kind of, when you're younger, you choose kind of what your kind of thing is. And then, yeah. For, and for me, just, just like, like you, uh, birding kind of came up on top and now, now it's an obsession as well. It's, it's just, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, because I mean, you've only got so much time. You can't you can't do everything. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, birding certainly is taking the front seat for me now. It's it's yeah. Well, it's it's more than just a hobby for me now. It's, it's my work. It's it's like at, at, the, at the core of my um, identity now. I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I still I still do play music, but um, less less so nowadays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, exactly the same as me. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's like you you, you 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 have so much energy. You know, you only have so much energy and. Of course, you know, with work and, and, and other things going on, um, you know, you have to kind of prioritize what you want to do with your free time, I, I suppose, you know, and, and, and whatever, whatever, whatever comes up on top is like, that's the thing. And so, and so I'm interested in, in kind of talking about the, the scene here on the, on the New South Wales coast, because it's, it's a wonderful spot for birding. Like I, when I first moved up here, it's like, wow, it's. I really, I really enjoy it up here. Like the, the the kind of environment and variety of birds as well, and the variety it's, of habitats. It's very diverse. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, and if you if you look on on eBird, for example, some of the um, the highest um, ranking LGAs and and hotspots um, for species diversity are on the on the mid north coast. Really. Um, I think yeah. So. Boyders Lane at Jerseyville in near Southwest Rocks, for example, is I think uh, number one or two um, for the highest number of species observed in New South Wales. So it is, yeah, it's a really fantastic and diverse area. For sure, yeah. yeah. Part- particularly in those um, years when it's a bit drier inland and you get sort of more of those inland species pushing over the over the ranges and onto the coast. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And and actually, when I, I have a little, little story here, when I first drove up from from Victoria to to, to move here. Um, I went through Barnett's Lagoon, so I saw this. I saw this hotspot, like along the Pacific Highway. It's like, oh, this, you know, because I was I was with, with my wife, and you know, she's a non-birder, and so I just wanted to kind of see what was there, and and I saw the banded lapwing, and I, I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I don't have much, <laughs> I don't know, I don't have much knowledge of of the, the rarity or or, the, or or whatever of of the birds of of the New South Wales coast. So I just thought, oh, that that's quite cool, and then I saw that it was marked as rare on the on the on the eBird app, so I was like, oh, that's that's kind of cool, and so and it turns out I was the first one to report it, and so yeah. the, the, those crazy stories. <laughs> well, this is funny because um, <laughs> yeah, I've actually got my my eBird alerts set for the Kempsey LGA where you saw that bird. And yeah, the things things that I haven't seen yet, you know, my ne- my needs list, and um, I saw that come up, and I hadn't re- seen your name before on in <laughs> on eBird in New South Wales, and I sort of made a bit of an assumption that perhaps you were visiting international bird because you have a sort of foreign sounding yeah. name and um thought oh maybe maybe you know someone's just visiting and, and got this wrong but um yeah it's funny that, that, that's the first time i saw, saw your name come up <laughs> no and that's that's what i love about birding you know like these these little events these little things can bring people together and and you know m- m- become a talking point and so that was cool i w- wanted to mention that and, yeah um, but that, bird, that bird's still there actually I, I saw it again only a couple of weeks ago so it's very cool very sticking cool. around sticking around cool yeah <laughs> well i mean I, I guess you have a similar story I don't. I don't really know this, but talk us talk to us a bit about the Aleutian Turn at Old Bar. That's that's a fascinating story. Like, how did that come about? Because I understand it's. The, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the only place in Australia that they're reliably seen. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, and um, I'll I'll try and tell a fairly brief version of the story. But um, so I had just been been birding around that that area, the Manning Estuary, and. Um, Old Bar and Harrington sort of area for a while because it is the best sort of spot for um, shorebirds in probably on the mid north coast. It's sort of some of the largest expanses of coastal sand flats, and you can get some interesting waders there that are really hard to find other places like sandling and you know the sand plovers, um, that kind of thing. Uh, the waders are just a little bit more uncommon, but uh, so I'd been going there for a couple of times and. Just to mainly take mainly interested in the waders, migratory waders, taking photos of them and trying to get new things from my local list. Um, and so in it must have been October 2016, I was there and I'd taken some photos of these turns 
on the sand sandbar and I was only just dipping my starting to dip my toes in the water when it came to turn ID and but I sort of knew that there was only really three turns that you or three or four that you expect there um, most of the time at that time of the year like little turns common turns and crested turns sometimes gold build but so it's only medium sized turns and I just snapped off a quick photo and in my head I think oh they're the common turns and um, Anyway, I'm pretty hopeless at cataloging and sorting my photos. So they kind of sat on, on my computer for 10 months. It was 10 really? months. It wasn't until, no. it wasn't until um, October the following year, 2017, that I looked at these photos again more closely. And by this stage, I'd gotten a bit better at turn ID and realised that they were, I didn't, didn't know there was something mega, but I thought there's something not right about these turns. They're different. I can't put a finger on it. I can't figure out what they are. And so I posted onto the um, Australian Bird ID Facebook group and, and a few people tweaked. Uh, so it was David Eads and Jeff Davies from Victoria, some sort of the turn experts, and suggested they were Aleutian terms and then it all went a little bit crazy then. But obviously wow. by this stage it was 10 months later, so I felt like a bit of an idiot that I'd photographed these birds, not realising what they were at the time, and then they were gone. <laughs> Um, so I went back to the same spot exactly 12 months, almost to the day since yeah. I'd taken that original photograph and there they were, uh, wow. at this time there was, I think the, the day I found them, I counted 13, um, was, um, but over the course of that summer, it was up to 18 birds there and just hundreds and hundreds of, of twitches came in. Yeah. And, um, and saw them, and they've been coming back. The birds, I mean, each each summer since. So um, they're there again this season. But access to the site's been a bit difficult this year because of the, um, the inlet mouth is open to the ocean now. So, but there's, the birds are still there. There's been up to six reported this season. Uh, wow, so it's pretty wild. I mean, up until only a few decades ago, the, the non-breeding range of this bird was almost completely unknown. Um, until I sort of started seeing them off in the Philippines and in, um, Indonesia and maybe northern New Guinea. So they knew they wintered in, the, in, in Southeast Asia. But, yeah, I mean, Old Bar, where I found them, was a pretty long way from the near, other nearest records. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, yeah, crazy stuff. It is. It really <laughs> is. It really, like, it's, it's, it's sometimes you just, it's hard to explain why... <laughs> You know, and and it's probably the same individual birds coming back, surely, isn't it? I would think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Perhaps each season, maybe they bring one or two more, or a couple drop off, or whatever. But I would imagine it's mostly the same birds, same flock. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. That's so cool. I I, I haven't been down there yet, actually. I've I've been meaning to. Um, um, and Jack Jack Morgan's gone down. I think he went yesterday, and I think I think he saw them. I, th I think he reported them. I think. Uh, I, sh I should have written it down, but yeah, amazing, amazing stuff. Really cool. Yeah. And, and then just recently, actually, a um, uh, an Aleutian turn got found blown inland up at uh, Iron Range on Cape York wow. after um, Sotgul Cyclone Seth, I think it was. Um, and so that that's the that was only the second confirmed record for the mainland. Um, there was a guy I can't remember his name, but he he was doing a geolocator study on Aleutian terns a few years back and um, might have had pings from the geolocators, one, one of, off the Capricorn coast of Queensland and then one off Christmas Island, I believe, oh, yeah. inside Australian waters. Um, so, you know, whether my the um, old bar birds were the first confirmed Australian record, I guess, is maybe up for debate, but it's certainly the, the first main, mainland record. And there's only been one since this recent one up in, um, in uh, Iron Range. So, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Fascinating story. I, I love that. I love the this, this stories of like, you know, birds that kind of come back every, you know, they're, they're so loyal. Some birds are so amazingly precisely loyal to, to sites, which is, I really like that. You know, it, it, it's, it's yeah. really, really interesting to kind of find that out. Like, you know, and, and to find one that must be, must be exhilarating. Like that's, Really cool. Yeah, it was, it was really... and, and so is that. So was is Old Bar kind of a patch of yours? I wanted to move on to to, to, to how, 
to your interest kind of in patch birding and local birding and LGA listing and all of that. So, 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 so talk us through that. How, how do you kind of bird locally? Um, it sort of started with um, the Hastings Bird Watchers, which is a local bird club that I um, am a member of, uh, based in, in Port Macquarie. And so the sort of area of interest includes the Manning and, and um, Maclay Valleys to the north and south. Um, and so it started as a, have a friendly year list competition each year yeah. in the club to see who can get the most species locally. So I was involved in that for the first couple of years. That, um, and that's why I kept going back to this. One of the reasons I kept going back to this site um, yeah. at, at Old Bar just to try and get new waiters for my local list. Um, and yeah, I guess it just comes back to not, not really having too many opportunities to travel. Um, yeah. You know, like nationally or, or internationally, obviously, the last couple of years. But um, so, yeah, I, I just feel like you can get that, I don't know, get a bit of excitement from getting new things on your local patch rather than travelling, I don't know, hundreds of miles or interstate to, just to try and get a new life bird. When, yeah. Yeah, and you know, eBird has um, divided up into all the LGAs, so it's endless um, opportunity for getting new birds. Yeah, in that no, sense. For sure. yeah. yeah, and well, that's something that kind of um, became more prominent during the pandemic as well, during all the lockdowns, and you know, the radius. At least in Melbourne, that was my experience, where you know, at one point, you could only go five kilometers from your house, and so I, I was in Glen Iris, which is a, in southeast Melbourne, and the only kind of <laughs> reasonably exciting birding spot was a, a park called Wattle Park, and you know. Yeah, really... I saw that on your on your um your YouTube channel. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And and yeah. it's like <laughs> it's it's and and you know it, I went regularly like like because because I could and it was the only place I could go and you know you know the stuff that you end up finding can be quite cool and Simon Starr was also quite regular to go there and you know he he saw some crazy stuff like a brown falcon flying over and. I once I, I got a, bl a black-shouldered kite once, like, and in the middle of the city, and like, and so, it's only through regular, constant uh, monitoring of a site that you can kind of compile a list, and that's the joy of, of, of patch listing and LGA listing, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very cool. Yeah, and so that comes into also, um, well, it's it's a bit more ambiguous, but the pelagic birding. Is is also something that that I, I believe that you you're you're quite excited about. And man, I'm so there was there was one off Southwest Rocks recently that you guys went on, and I, I couldn't I couldn't come on that one. But I, I love pelagics, and they're they're just so cool. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, man. yeah, yeah. I am very interested in in pelagics. I'm I'm still uh, I guess a beginner in in some respects. As um, I haven't I've only been doing it a couple of years, but um, yeah, I decided to try and organise. My own pelagics out of Southwest Rocks on the mid North Coast because there just wasn't anything regular um, mm. between uh, Port Stephens and Southport, really. So there's this big gap on the north coast of New South Wales where there weren't any regular pelagics going out. So, um, yeah, yeah, I just decided to try and organise a few myself, and I haven't got anything up uh, regular yet. I haven't been able, to, haven't been able to commit to like a monthly. Mm. schedule or anything like that but just now and then when i when i find the time and i've been trying to get boats out yeah because i, I just find seabirds so fascinating and um again so much uh, potential for i guess exploration and finding new birds and interesting stuff that in an area that hasn't been surveyed very very well so yeah for sure yeah, yeah. um yeah, and I'm also, I'm also quite into land-based sea watching as well. I kind of get my seabird fix from from that when I can't um, get out on boats because yeah, I can just go up to any headland when there's a nice southerly blowing or a southeasterly and um, set up and, and watch the sheer waters go past. And um, and every now and then, yeah, you get you can get something special from from land-based as well. And I, I actually find that can be a really satisfying way to get good birds from a sea watch because it's quite a challenging um form of birding you know you, birds are small they're moving pretty quickly a lot of the time and um, disappearing behind waves and 
yeah, so I really, really enjoy sea watching. Yeah, that's that's a type of birding that I really haven't explored at all. Like, because I understand that you have to kind of spend quite a lot, of, a lot of time doing it to, to to get to get the birds. Is that right? Like, a couple of hours. A lot least. of time. Yeah, I've spent. I mean, I spend hundreds of, of hours just sitting there, and and often it's pretty slow going. Um, <laughs> that kind of like. It, but it only takes one good bird to make a good sea watch. You know, you can sit there for hours just watching hundreds of you know, common stuff, wedge tab shearwaters, and then you might just get one, something really good in it. Yeah. So it's it's challenging and um, time consuming, but it's also a very rewarding form of birding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and I suppose it's it's quite um, hassle free. Like it doesn't require you know you get there and you you stay there and. That's all you do, like that. You don't have to kind of organize too many logistical things, like you would for like an outback trip when you go inland to see inland birds or whatever. Yeah, that's right. Just take it, take take a chair and scope and. Yeah. Yeah. Well, another thing I wanted to touch on, um, Liam, was your work with the Difficult Bird Research Group. I was I was really interested in in, in reading that. You sent me the link. Um, so, so how long have you been with those guys and, and, and what's the main focus of, of the group? Uh, so I, I've been working, um, under Dr. Ross Crates, he's my supervisor and he, I, um, started out as a volunteer originally while he was doing his PhD on Regent Honey Eaters and I was just, um, just started studying myself and I wanted to try and get into, um, that kind of field of work by volunteering um, and that uh, a few seasons of volunteering just a week here and there during the springtime and then um, that led to some, some paid work casually and then eventually, yeah, full-time full -time role as a research assistant. So, yeah, um, like you said in the intro, most, mostly on the Regent Honey Eater monitoring program. So um, each spring we've got... Uh, it's, well, over 1,200 monitoring sites throughout the core breeding range of the region, honey eater, that we and we visit each site. Wow, 1,200 twice, twice. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we this um, <clears throat> collaborate with BirdLife on on this project as well. So um, a subset of the sites, I don't, like we don't do the whole whole 1,200 sites ourselves, but um, there's a lot of surveys. There's a, a lot of yeah, lots and lots of surveys each season. We get lots of zeros, <laughs> um, wow. but yeah, when we do find the birds, it's it's then a matter of um, trying to protect the nest from predators. Um, yeah, and you know, monitor monitor breeding success, and just gathering lots of data, to try and inform the conservation of the region honey eaters. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if you listened to the episode I did with Max Breckenridge. Um, but, but yeah, he, he's also, he's also in that kind of area where they're, and, and I think they're, they're putting satellite tags they're, they're trying out to put satellite tags on some of them, which like GPS. Yeah. So I know, yeah, yeah. I know Max well, I work, work, work with Max often. Um, yeah, there's, there's still a few wild birds, um, congregating in a, in a site in the Hunter Valley. Yeah. Um, where they with their, um, you know, they had the captive release there a few months ago, um, which was quite successful in that the release birds are, uh, are now um, starting to flock together with the wild birds po post-breeding and they've been roosting together and that kind of thing. So it's really exciting. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know too much about the satellite transmitter um, project that they have going on at the moment, but I, I know that they've just recently um, received the the transmitters that are small enough yeah to go on a on a large male region honey I mean it's yeah they've, you know they've only just developed the technology to get those yeah things small enough so it, um but it will be amazing to see where these birds go um after they they've dispersed from the breeding grounds because yeah we just don't know it's almost like they vanish for a couple of months <laughs> Wow, um, and that's then fascinating. Before they start, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what really blows my mind is when I was I live in Wulgulga, and um, there's a record that that you submitted to Ebert of a, a Regent honey eater on the headland. Is that right? 
Yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. Crazy. That, was, that was a strange bird. So, um, yeah, that, I believe I think that was in winter. So, what often happens is in um, these single male birds will turn up on the coast and they, oh, okay, um, they just yeah. sing like they vocalize like other species. Like that bird, particular bird at Wargoogle was singing like a little wattle bird. Just, um, he didn't make any any region honey in a sort of typical region yeah. vocalizations at all. Um, and that's a, I don't know if you saw in the media last year that, um, yeah, there was, there's a paper published by my supervisor, Ross, that about the birds um, losing their song culture in the wild in yeah. the regions. And, yeah. um, this is one of the problems that, yeah, you get some male birds that have probably dispersed away from their, their natal area when they're, after they've fledged and then not been able to find any other male region I mean, just to learn to sing from. Yeah. Um, and that was prob- probably the case with that, that wool googa bird. Yeah, it was a bit of a random spot for one to turn up, actually. Crazy, just yeah. In a bank, just in a banks here in a, in a beach car park at New Wool Googa. It's, Fantastic. It's not quite your t- typical sort of spot you'd find one. No, absolutely, and it, that's that's also comes back to the joy of birding. You can see anything anywhere. That's that's what's so great. Like, literally, you can see anything anywhere. I, I, I love that. And and yeah, well, I mean, and and again, that the guy that found that bird, I believe that he sort of just did that walk every day, seeing what he could find. And then you know, one yeah. one day there's a region honey eater there, so it just comes comes back to that hatch birding thing again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and, and that's and also like the importance of photography in that moment, like for, for, the, for, 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 the, for the report and the official record um, and, and with the illusion turns as well, like it's so important to nowadays, I suppose, to have a, a really good photo to, to confirm an, a record and to correctly identify a bird, I guess. What, what are your thoughts on that? Like how it's evolved over the years? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I always carry my camera on me. I wouldn't consider myself really a photographer per se. I, I, I'm never out to, um, to try and get the best photo of a bird. I'll, but if something presents itself nicely in some nice light or something, I'll, I'll usually take a photo. But I always carry a, a camera on me for that, um, for that reason, of, in case you see something interesting or rare or um, just for an ID shot that kind of thing. So, yeah, I think it's definitely helpful to, to have a camera on you for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that's pretty much how I, how I see it as well is, is you, you, you have, you have the camera just in case something rare turns up or something beautiful turns up, but uh, yeah. Um, but, but it is sometimes kind of a struggle to, to, to balance the, the two things. Like, um, for me anyway, like, because I'm quite into video as well. I, I like to film birds. And, 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 and as you said before, I'm, I, I like to kind of make documentary style mini, mini kind of summaries of areas with birds. And so I like to kind of capture them on film as well, which captures the, you know, the more of the behavior and, and the vocal aspects of a bird too. But, um, but yeah, it's certainly a thing to, to, to balance, you know, um, like for me, I'd always go with the binoculars first. And then it's like, okay, like I've had a great look at this bird. It's beautiful. And now I can take a shot. Like, see what I mean? Like, it's kind yeah, of a... <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I don't know. It's not, often I will go for the um, camera first if I think this bird's going to get away on me <laughs> or, um, you know, like, a, uh, I don't know, button quails, for example. I've been getting a little bit obsessed with trying to find button quails lately. And, um, yeah, like, Seeing one flash, perhaps a really quick look with the with the bins, but then I want to try and get that yeah that record shot. And there's, I mean, they're super hard to photograph. Um, pelagics, I would usually go the camera first, uh huh, because those birds can just, you know, so many so many birds on pelagics end up being identified from photos. Um, so I think <clears throat> super important for seabirds, yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure, man. I, I, I really. If, if, have you got anything planned for for like the next couple of months for the South West Rocks Pelagic, or is it? I wanted to try and get one out. Um, trying to wanted to try and get one out in early April. Ah. Uh, if if I can, but I've, I'm pretty busy. I've got a few things coming up. Um, mm-hmm. the next couple of months, but I might try and squeeze it in. I've got some other people asking me, so 
And yeah, I want to I want to try and get out again while the water's still warm. Try and get some of those tropical warm water birds. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Get, keep me posted, please. I'd love to go on the next one, man. It's, well, I will. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And talking of having time and stuff, like I guess that for me as well, this experience is like the, the, having the time from work and also family commitments and relationship commitments is is kind of a, a difficult thing for us birders most of the time. I mean, in my experience, it's kind of the thing that kind of um, impedes going out a lot. Like especially, I would say especially work and because I, I'm in hospitality, so it's quite a draining job, and so. It does. It does kind of drain me a lot and, and, and impedes me from going out sometimes. Um, but I usually I usually make the yeah. effort. I hear you, man. I was I was a chef for years. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, it is tiring. <laughs> and and how, um, how did you balance that? How how do you have any like may, maybe you don't well, have any? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm fairly fortunate, I guess, in a way, in in the sense that birding is my work as well. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I don't have any kids. Um, I, yeah, my my, my partner's um, independent and enjoys her own <laughs> her time to herself as well. So we, you know, I, I have actually plenty of time for birding, but um, I know that it's quite tough, and um, especially people with kids, mm. and you know, and really full on jobs. That take up a lot of their time and, and energy. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, but there. Although birding is <laughs> incredibly important to to us, and I'm guessing anyone else is watching or listening. Um, but but there are, you know, other very important things in life that you shouldn't <laughs> neglect. I think perhaps in my past I've maybe gone birding when I should have been studying or um you know kind of neglected some other responsibilities at <clears throat> at certain times in my life but i think now i've learned to um moderate the obsession a little bit into something a bit more healthy <laughs> <laughs> overall balanced um but yeah it's important not not to neglect the other really very important things in life at work study family relationships and yeah health those kind of things yeah no absolutely yeah 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 i mean it's, it's like with anything you know it's good it's always good to you know anything done at extreme lengths typically doesn't it isn't it isn't healthy i, I guess you can yeah say yeah that, you, you, can get, you can have too much of a good thing you know <laughs> mm. um but yeah I, um i think i think alberta should i don't know when trying to balance that work and family life maybe plan, you know, one one good trip a year, a week long, or it doesn't even have to be a week, maybe a long weekend or something, but plan birding trips for yourself, um, something to, to look forward to. And then, you, I don't know, you don't feel it. Maybe then you don't have to feel like you have to be out every weekend mm -hmm. birding if you've got, you got this bigger trip to look forward to where you can just go and bird guilt-free all day, every day for that period of time. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. Yeah, to, to to have the anticipation and the planning leading up to a, a, a like a a period of time where you can have time to yourself, I guess. And and actually, this wasn't one of the questions, but it's it's one that I enjoy asking on the podcast because the, the answers are helpful to me and I think to listeners as well. Um, which is, what do you what do you think makes a good birder? What what does a good birder do in order to be a good birder? Do, do you see what I mean? Yeah, that's a good question. I've heard, and I, you know, I've heard you ask that a bunch of times, but I, I guess I haven't really thought <laughs> too much about that. Um, uh, well, I think one of your your other guests might have touched on this as well, but I, I really think that, especially when starting out, um, just developing that uh, that foundation by getting to know your, mm. the common stuff really really well. Um, yeah. But before branching out, like there's just so much to learn. I mean, it's infinite. But if you can just just really build that foundation of learning the common stuff, learning the calls, um, understanding habitats and sort of biogeography and 
um, bird movements and seasonal movements and that kind of thing um, for me is really important. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, like good record keeping. I think good birders are good record keepers and um, diligent, very diligent with getting IDs right. This getting getting IDs right is so important um, because it's it's more than just about your list. Um, mm-hmm. I know, yeah. I'm speaking. I'm speaking. If you if you're submitting your list to um, eBird or the other pu- public databases, so. You've got bird, bird data, which is the Bird Life Australian database, and then there's others as well. I, I naturalist, and yeah. um, I don't know Atlas of Living Australia. There's a bunch of databases, but these there are real implications for for science and conservation and understanding bird distributions, abundance, and and movements and that kind of thing. So, just getting the IDs right, um, being being really careful. Um, and the golden rule of like, if if in doubt, leave it out. You know. Yeah, I like that. I think um, being an obsessive lister, I know that the the urge can be strong to tick tick that <laughs> bird, but it's that's not more important than getting it right. It's never more important than getting the ID right every time. So yeah, if in doubt, leave it out. Yeah, I I really like that. Yeah, I haven't heard that specific phrase before, but that's really good. I. I have really high standards with with that, you know. I, I really like to scrutinize myself to really be confident that something is is correctly ID'd. Like, if and, and if I'm even a little bit unsure, it's like, nah. Like, it's 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 worth because and it also means that you have something else to to look for next time, you know. Yeah, exactly. And, and you you learn a little bit each time, and and that ties in also to the the next topic, which I think was tips for new birders. Because it's so important in a, in a in a hobby and in a passion and in a community to kind of encourage new and up and coming birders as well. And if any of them are listening now, thanks for being here, guys. Um, um, and and it's really important, like you said, just to kind of keep learning and and I think um, being um, surrounded by by birders who are experienced is really helpful as well because you can learn a lot from. From people, yeah, you know, not yeah, just yeah, books. Yeah, for sure. I'd, I'd, mm. I'd say it's um to to beginner birders. Yeah, don't be afraid to reach out and perhaps seek out a mentor, maybe, or just more experienced birders that you can go birding with. Most experienced birders are, are really happy to help mm. and and share their knowledge. And um, I re- I really enjoy um, you know, going birding with someone that and and they're getting a bunch of new birds that. I haven't seen before and kind of sharing that excitement it's almost like you're reliving that in a way of something that you know you might have seen a million times but when someone else sees it for the first time and you see how happy they are it's it's really cool and yeah um yeah i was really fortunate to to have a few sort of people i considered mentors in the years that i was getting back into birding and mm-hmm. I learned a lot from them so yeah um yeah, I mean, and when you're not birding, you can, you know, so much um, content and information to that you could be reading. Or um, one thing that did help me a lot when I think about it now is um, being active in the the Australian Bird ID Facebook group, which I'm also now one of the the admins of uh, moderators of that group. Um, yeah, so seeing so many different photos on that. On that group of birds from as you would see them in the field so you know just might yeah. be some strange angle or really bad light and I, I learned a lot from just um yeah it's, it's different to just looking in the, the field guide where it's nice lateral two-dimensional um picture of the bird no absolutely so, yeah 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 for sure and actually the, the facebook group um, New South Wales Rare Bird Alert. You're also part of, aren't you? Like the, do you also moderate that one? Yeah. So uh, uh, last year, my friend Heath uh, Heath Milne that you, you've met. Um, yeah. We were just chatting about that there was no dedicated um, Facebook group for for rare birds in New South Wales. Like, so there was equivalent sort of groups in other states like Birdline Victoria and uh, Birdline NT and 
think there's a Queensland rabbit birds group. Um, so there was, yeah, there was nothing that existed for New South Wales. So we just thought, well, why don't we start one? Um, so we did, and it, it's ticking along pretty well so far. We're getting new members every day. I think we're up uh, 1,500 members or more maybe. Um, and, yeah, there's been lots of good, really good rare birds posted there. So the idea was just to set up something where you, it would get real-time alerts. You know? Yeah. Because um, this is the Aramea Bird Lines website, which, you know, still has its place, but things can take a, a day or two to get published. And, um, yeah, just wanted something where people wanted to set notifications. Yeah. Um, and, and where you can you know, develop a thread and discussions about birds, which you can't do on, on um, Birdline. So, yeah. So just give it a, a shameless plug. If anyone um, isn't on New South Wales Rare Bird Alert and Facebook, jump on there. Yeah, absolutely. Please do. Yeah, it's great, great, great kind of page. And, and, and also, it also ties into the, to the eBird Alert thing that, that I use quite a lot. I, I get the daily eBird Alerts. Um, and that also, it's often the same reports, isn't it? The, the, the kind of, but the great thing with the, with the Facebook page is that it's, it's, it's almost more instant because you, get, you, you can get the photo and, and real time and commenting. And so it's, it really is a kind of a community, which, which I really appreciate, you know, the, commun yeah. the communal aspect of birding is, is really great to enjoy as well, I think. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And the, um, the eBird alerts are good too, but they're also, uh, they also lag by, um, a day or half a day or something, you know, they, it, the email only gets sent out once uh, every 24 hours, I believe. Uh -huh. um, I think so it's not, it's not, can, can, I think you can unless, change you, it unless you select. Yeah. I think you can change, you, uh, you can choose hourly. I think, I, I think this is a recent update they did that we can choose hourly or daily to get the alerts. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm just but, stuck on the, uh, but I don't want an hourly e emails <laughs> with, with um, all this, you know, and a lot of it's not actually, yeah, um, rare stuff. It's you know, yeah, things that get flagged, flagged um, for review. <laughs> yeah, so. no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's all it's all kind of so dynamic and multifaceted. The whole the whole system, you know, which I love. You, there's so much you can kind of learn about it, and, and yeah, um, yeah, that's right, for sure, for sure. So let's start wrapping up, Liam. Um, so I have the I have the age-old question, um, which is, what is your favourite bird? Do you have a, a specific bird? Yeah. So I, I I had a look at these questions and I come up with a. If you'll indulge me in a sort of multiple, <laughs> multi-pronged answer. Um, so as a as groups of birds, um, seabirds, I just absolutely love. I've, so fascinated by, by seabirds and their the mystery and yeah how they live out their lives in these big crazy environments um and there's still so much we don't know about seabirds so i love seabirds uh land birds um the wood swallows are one of my favorite uh -huh. favorite um groups of birds i i just love their you know they so got so much character. That beautiful powder down plumage, like pastel, yeah, kind of plumage, and the cheek is just yeah, they're great. I never tire of watching wood swallows. Um, like I mentioned briefly earlier, I've been getting into button quails quite a bit lately, and trying to figure out the and do a bit of sound recording with the button quails because I think we they um, a lot of their calls are poorly understood, so. Um, I don't know if that's one of my favourite birds, but just recently that's been a focus of mine. But um, obviously you might have seen these coming. My, my favourite bird is the Regent Honey. They're just mm -hmm. the best. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. I could, I, could talk, I, could talk, I could do a whole episode talking about Regent Honey, um, but maybe for another day. Let's do it. Yeah, let's, 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 let's do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because, I mean, we, had, we only really just touched on, on, a, on uh, my work very briefly, but perhaps we could do another Another show about that. No, I, I, yeah, they're a fascinating bird, really fascinating, especially the, the type of bird in, in a similar vein to the to the passenger pigeon of North America. They used to be quite common, right? They used to be kind of everywhere 
Is that, is that yeah, right? Yeah, they were, they were, that's right. They were probably never um, as abundant as things like noisy firebirds and um, red wattle birds, but they were, cert- they were certainly yeah. um, <clears throat> much, much more common than they are now. In the old reports of sort of flocks of hundreds of birds dominating patches of flowering trees and yeah wow yeah um down to within a couple of you know within 50 years looking at possibly fewer than 300 birds remaining in the wild yeah so Mm. some pretty grim but there's hope and um yeah i should come back and we'll chat about that we will (laughs) we will we'll do it let's let's consider it done and and so the final question is um what is your like if you could if you had one opportunity to go and bird somewhere that is your dream destination anywhere in the world where where would that be um yeah i thought about this as well and i think for seabirds i i would just have to say um south georgia oh yeah yeah in, in like the antarctic peninsula yeah um, just you know, hundreds of thousands of penguins and albatrosses, petrels. Yeah, I think wow. I'd be in, in heaven there. <laughs> oh, those yeah, those yeah. Antarctic islands are epic, man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. So that's on my bucket list for sure. South Georgia and Antarctica. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's so cool. All right. Well, that's that's a great place to end on with the 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 South Georgia. Imagine, yeah. You know, oh, imagine- yeah. One of I missed one of my other um. Favorite birds or dream bird was it? Oh, dream bird, yeah, dream of course, bird. yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so I had a Ch- Chatham albatross oh. yeah, for my dream bird. Uh huh. Yeah. That's that's I a just, good one. Yeah, I'd love to see that. But... Did do they get to South Georgia? Did do, do, do they go down there? I don't think so. No, they breed on um, Chatham Islands down off um, southeast of New Zealand. Hmm. So oh yeah, they. They perhaps forage around like circumpolar, but um, I, they, they don't breed down down there. No. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I absolutely wish you all the best with with, with that. You know, and <laughs> thanks. Th- 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 think things are things are opening up now. Hopefully, so we can kind of g- go and do those kind of trips again. Um, but yeah, it's it's been it's been such a huge pleasure, Liam. And I hope to meet you in the flesh. Now we're you know quite close geographically. So. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, thanks for having me, Ben. I um. And I'll, I'll keep you in the loop for the, the Southwest Rocks Pelagics. Please do. That that would be fantastic. All righty. All right. I, and I just want to say um, thanks for all your, your the hard work and um, your time pulling together the podcast. Like, I can imagine that's a lot of work, especially behind the scenes with all the editing. So, and, and yeah, bringing you bring so much good content to the birding world. So, thank you. Oh, thanks so much. That, that's really encouraging. Really, thank you. So, and I, and I hope to keep going. So. It, it, it's uh, just the beginning. <laughs> All right. All the best. Righto. Thanks, Liam. Bye bye. You have been listening to the Birding Today podcast. New episodes are released every Friday. And if you'd like to get in touch, just write an email to birdingtoday at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. And see you next time. <laughs>